for Tips and Tricks, which is my little series on Ableton production. And today we're gonna follow up with gain staging, specifically with reverb and delay effects. So the idea here is I'm going into Facebook and YouTube. I'm gonna watch on YouTube and comment and watch the chat on YouTube because that's where the replay is best. I just put it live into the Facebook group to let you know it's happening, it's going on. So come on over to YouTube with me. And as soon as this pops up, I'll go into full screen with live and we'll do a little sesh happening here. There's my uh, view. I'm in uh, full fisheye camera mode here. I didn't want to do the whole overlay thing. Because I'm just going to go full screen. You don't need to see me on top of the, um, the, the program. And especially when I'm working with effects racks in the device tray, I didn't want the little Steve on top of the device tray because then it's like you can't see it. So come on in and say hi in the YouTube chat. That's youtube.com slash mix a texture. Time for me to put my phone on vibrate. Love you people, but I'm not gonna be hearing that sound while I'm on a live video. And we're gonna talk about the end of gain staging with effects returns. Um, did you know that making a mix into an effects return is basically making another sub mix to another group? You can think about your effects returns as like a stereo pair and you're mixing into them with send knobs. The send knobs are like volume faders going into your effects group. So that's what we're gonna look at. That's what we're gonna talk about. Just making sure we got some people coming in on YouTube. And if you happen to be seeing on Facebook right now, come over to the YouTube channel. You can watch on Facebook, but if you wanna comment and ask questions, and if you want me to answer your questions, you gotta be in the YouTube chat because I can um, only watch one place at a time. There's my audio coming up, somebody watching. All right, whoever's watching on YouTube, say hi, let me know you're here. And let's get up. I did a little audio check. I think it should be working. That's usually when you get in trouble when you think your audio is working and you're like, my audio is not working. <laughs> and happy Wednesday to everybody. Okay, so I'll close that. So here's Ecamm. Here is screen share. And here is Ableton View. Bring up the music level a little bit. And let me stop that. Okay, so let's just run through a little bit of um, what we're looking at. So, okay, here's a session. I got three chunks of sounds, just for basic introduction. I know you probably heard this track already a couple times in the last few weeks. I've been going through it with gain staging. What we did to start off with was we looked at channels at the individual level. And the basic thing we did was I looked at the peak level meters on the input side of the channel. So if you look at this effects rack, on the left and right side, there are two little green meters bouncing up and down, which are the input meters. They show you the level of sound coming through the input of that channel. What that means is I can mute, mute the track outputs, but when I look at those meters, guess what? Those little green levels are still bouncing because there is sound coming through the input. Get my gate just to the right level. So input meters, you want to, just like on a DJ mixer, you want to get them up to the top of the available space so that anytime you push up the output level or the fader on the DJ mixer, you want to make sure you're going to have a loud level to work with. What you don't want to have is your input meter way down at the bottom, like a little quiet record, and then you're trying to jack your track fader up to the top to get some output and then turn up your master volume to make it louder. It doesn't work. If you're DJing and you want two faders that go up and both records drop at the same pressure level, you got to match your input levels the track output fader doesn't really matter until the inputs are matched. So gain staging is all about measuring and adjusting your level to make sure that every time a signal is coming through something, you know it's at that loud level and it's going to work. If you're just joining, I'm on YouTube for the chat and the comments. So come on over to YouTube and uh, let me know what's happening over there. So what did we do? We used an effects rack on every channel to basically maximize the signal coming through. So the input fader on the right side post effects is up to the top of the available space or uses all available headroom. And then we can bring it into the mix. And I wrote some automation in this uh, session because this is one of my session lessons for the gain staging course, which I'll tell you about at the end. Now we went through each channel with kick and bass, got a little foundation built so that our master channel is working and did the same thing with the drums group. I got about 10 channels of drums in here. And what we're gonna do today is turn up aux send A and take a look at our drum reverb. So I'll get to that in a second, just to let you know these channels have all been dialed in with an effects rack, same thing. The input level before the effects is a little lower. After the effects rack, it's up to the top. So we know we have a nice, healthy, loud sound coming out. 
Um, I was talking about coffee and tea a lot. Like gain staging is kind of like making sure your coffee is espresso every time coming out in every cup and not something like a cup of coffee dumped out into a bathtub that's all watered down and barely brown. Now, drums group minimize and the instruments group. This is a fun group because we've got a couple mid-range pads that maybe could use some space around them. We've got this ping delay that's totally dry definitely could use some effects. And then we've got a bass sound that has a little delay built in as part of the sound design. So we're going to explore effects on that instrument also. And the interesting thing about effects is they change your perception of space in the mix. And when you add an effect, you're adding a little percentage of the original sound in volume. So when you add effects, you get some mix creep, or in other words, your mix level feels like it gets louder and it does get a little bit louder. So sometimes you can make a rough mix, and then when you add your effects at the end, you gotta mix it back down a little bit lower just to um, keep your levels in place. So let's work with the drums first. The interesting thing about working with aux returns is you can put many different sounds into them. So you can see, none of my channels have a reverb. There's no reverb plugin in any of these effects units. These are all effects I built to just kind of approximate what we have on a channel strip on a digital mixing board with gain controls, EQ, compression, gate limiter, that kind of thing. If I wanted to put reverb on every channel in the drums mix, I'd be using like 10 reverb plugins. They might all have a different sound. They use more CPU and then they get all splashy and overlapping and you don't really, I mean, you get reverb, but you don't really get the sounds of space the same way. So I like to use aux returns because they let me have one reverb unit and I can put multiple sounds into it and get a more cohesive sound. And please understand that in the beginning of electronic music, producers were just using outboard effects. Sometimes they only had one effects unit for the whole track and everything would go into it. I mean, they, whatever they wanted would go into it. So it might be like vocals, keyboard, drums, all going into that one reverb unit and that would be what's on the track. And there's some famous, famous records that just have like one reverb and maybe one delay. So you don't need a bazillion reverbs at all. You just need to use them judiciously. And the concept, in case you're not familiar with returns, is that the return is a destination and the send will give you levels at that destination. So here I am soloing my return. Let's go to a simple sound called claps. This is return A. If I go to send A, you get volume just from that one track. Effects off, effects on. So the name of the game here is to blend the sounds so we have the amount of reverb we want from every sound. Now, do I want all my reverbs in there? Maybe I do. What about these toms? All right, that's like a tom fill that doesn't happen be very often. Maybe that doesn't need to be in there. How about like... There's the dry sound. So what I think I'm gonna do is identify the most important sounds in the mix and put those into the reverb first. So let's start with this uh, beat two. The reason I say it's important is because this is like a kick drum and a, and a snare. It's not the main kick drum, that's on track one. So I'm gonna add a little reverb on here. Get this going into the mix. Claps, also important because usually they're up front in the center, kind of like a snare drum, heavy sound. Hey, Hugo's here, what's happening? What I'm doing right now is I'm panning a few tracks side to side. So with these little hi-hat loops and shakers, instead of trying to put them in the reverb to bring them into the mix, I'm gonna put them off to the sides and see if that helps add to the feeling of space. Toms I'm gonna to ignore because they're not even happening that often. Claps we got in there. I think I will add this clink loop because it's kind of a, it's kind of cool, but it's maybe not the most important one. Hi-hat one and wood shaker feel like kind of a pair, high frequency, shaker, constant motion. So I'm gonna pan those right and left, not put them in the reverb yet. 
when they're a high frequency constant sound that's going I don't really feel like I need a wispy reverb on top of that. How about this switch? That's a riser at the end. And I definitely want that in the reverb to echo over the next um, downbeat and sound bigger and more spacious. And then how about our friend on track 14, The Crash? Here's Dry. And here's with tons of reverb. So yes, now just check out the levels I, I chose for like beat two that I, that I said was basically a really important sound, kick and, kick and snare. I put the reverb up about halfway and same for the claps, above halfway a little bit. For that clink loop, I went a little bit lower because that was not such an important sound. The swoosh all the way, I'm happy to almost double the level of that sound. And the crash, actually I think I'll back that off a little bit because I don't quite want so much of that. So what I'm actually doing is making a mix of these drums, just like in the channels mix, where the more important ones are louder and the other ones are less loud. Let's listen to our drum mix. We're gonna solo the drum reverb, and here's the first hot tip of the day. If you solo your return and just and, and bypass your effects, you can basically check your stereo mix of your drums and hear how it sounds. I'll turn up the stream send, because I know the level's a little low. So what we're doing right now is we're only listening to the drum reverb, well, we're only listening to return A, but the effects are bypassed. And by using the send knobs, my goal here is to pretty much make a drum mix that sounds good. Just the same way as using the output faders. Because after we did the gain staging at the individual channels with the input levels, all of our outputs are gonna work at the same way. So our track output fader works for making a mix and all our aux sends work for making a mix that just goes to a different place. So now I'm just gonna bring in a little bit of these. And check it out. Now I'm hearing a stereo mix of these sounds. When that hi-hat is panned left in the main mix, it comes up left in the reverb return. Let's see about these toms. And the idea here is, now that I made a nice mix in the drum in the reverb return, when I kick the effects on, the reverb should be getting a balanced mix of the drum kit just the same way that the drums were doing. So let's kick this on. Here we get. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a reverb. Doesn't really make a whole lot of sense until we bring it in with the whole drum kit. So here we go. Here's our drum mix. And Hugo, let me know, how's the level of what we're listening to? If this, um, if you need more of something, let me know. Maybe I'll bring back up my... Okay. Now what I'm gonna do is fade up my reverb and see if, the question is, does the reverb sound natural and does it feel like it's applying to all the drums the way I want to make everything sound better? Sounds perfect, thank you. That comment sounds perfect. <laughs> So when I get up to around minus 13, I start hearing the drum reverb come in. And my favorite way to test reverbs is like this. You put it up until you just hear the reverb in the mix, and then you mute the channel. And when you get the reverb at the right level, what it should sound like is when it's in, you don't even notice it. It's like a subconscious, subliminal background kind of surrounding thing. But when you mute the reverb return, it should feel like there's a hole in the mix. Matt Schultz poking a hole in the mix. Dude, that dub techno mix set you put up, I was really enjoying that all morning. I'm gonna play it again after this workshop. In fact, I might even stop early so I could go listen to it. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I really liked it. Okay, so what we're doing is, in case you just came in, I basically made a mix going into return A. I bypassed the, the, the reverb unit. I went to the send knobs and I said to myself, okay, now I'm making a mix. What if, what if return A is an output on the mixing board that's going to another set of speakers in another room? 
What if I have a stereo aux with an output going to the chill out room and I want to send a mix over there and then I'm in the main room and I want to have a main mix in one room. Sometimes you do that. When you're mixing on stage, you absolutely have different outputs for different speaker systems. So um, the concept I want everybody to understand is that the send knobs are just another stereo mix exactly like your track outputs. So when you're doing your gain staging, you do your input mix using the peak meters on the before and after part of your channel strip and they show you the level that your effects are adding or subtracting. And once your gain staging is done on your input side, you have multiple track outputs that can all be different stereo mixes. So obviously the track sliders, the faders, are your main mix to your stereo bus. Out, it goes out your master one and two, and that goes to your monitors, your headphones, whatever. Your other sends are stereo mixes that can go other places. So in studio land, we're making those for reverbs and delays and possibly headphone mixes to your artists. Uh, sometimes a, a return, an aux send return could be like the singer wants more of their voice and less bass guitar. Maybe the bass player wants more kick drum and less of the lead guitar. <laughs> and maybe the guitarist wants all themselves and kick drum. You know, so headphone mixes can be different depending on the person who wants to hear them. The point is your send knobs are another place to make a stereo mix. And the first thing I did was I put up a stereo mix and bypassed the return. I bypassed the effects. Let's just solo return A and hear the stereo mix of our drums. All right. Let me just check that crash. Let's have that crash nice and loud, and then maybe, whoop, sorry, that headphone level. And I want a little more of that, and then I love the part about the aux return being a stereo return. So when I pan my hi-hats and things to the left and right, put them up in the send, they come back as stereo in the return. Now we are prepared to kick on our reverb and start shaping our reverb and everything. That's 100% wet. Let's bring that into the mix. What's the right level again? Oh, it's when you can hear it subliminally, but when you mute, it feels like it goes missing. Let me know if you can hear that reverb. Give me a yes if you hear the reverb. Another good trick is just to play quickly and then stop and listen. All right, so I got it to a level where I can hear the reverb when it's in, but it's not like a huge, massive sound. And again, I'm also mixing in headphones. Be aware that in headphones, you normally you tend to add more reverb than is necessary. And when you're listening in speakers, usually you don't need as much reverb. Something about how the speakers in the room have a natural reverb, and that makes it like you don't want to hear as much in the track. Blah, 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 acoustics. Okay, so now we got a drum reverb set up. I want to show you a little bit about this reverb effects unit. I was mixing the output down a little bit. Let's see what's in the reverb unit. I'm gonna put this up a little bit so we can hear it. Uh, I like to play with reverb size and time and volume. So the first thing is, the reverb has two components. One is the early reflections, which is like the sounds bouncing off the wall and coming right back to you. The other part is the diffusions which is the sound kind of echoing around everything else up in the ceiling. And I know this is super quiet right now. I don't even know if you can hear that. What are we going to do? We're going to use a compressor after the reverb to raise the level of this sound. There's construction outside my house, so I'm trying to use a gate on my voice and really keep it out of the way. Sorry about that. And now I can do a little gain staging to bring up the level of 
my reverb with a compressor. So compressed reverb, kind of fun. So let's dial the threshold down. Wow, it's not even hitting in there. Maybe we need a little more level coming in. And now when I bypass, So if you're working with a sound where you want to have like a smaller, tighter room, maybe you could back off on those diffusion echoes and just bring up more of your early reflections. Uh, Matt, right now I'm just using a push two. And what I'm going for right here is like a nice, tight kind of a drum room. And we can even go deeper into that with reverb size and decay time. So let's play with that. Right now we're listening to all early reflections, no diffusions, making a pretty exaggerated sound of like drums slapping around in a, well, the reverb's called tile room from Ableton, but that would be like playing drums in a cement garage or something. Let's check out decay time. So it gets a little ridiculous at five seconds. How about down here a little more? Somewhere around there and reverb size, approximating how big the room is. And that gets almost into being like a slap back delay. So just for fun, let's do like a super big room. We're doing make believe, pretending we're in a giant room somehow magically has a fast decay, even though it's big. <laughs> and what would the diffusions be like that on there? Okay. Tell me if you hear the difference, the difference between the reflections and diffusions. Those diffusions go on longer, and the reflections are like, do you hear that outside? That's a freaking jackhammer. <laughs> Talk about gain staging your lessons with the construction outside. Okay, so we got, um, Two elements of the sound, the fast slapback reflections and then the longer diffusions, and we can blend them. To get two elements of the track. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unsolo the reverb, play the drums, and mix in these two parts of the reverb to hear what we get. Hugo's saying, yeah, there's a difference. Gotcha, cool. There's our drum mix. Here comes the reflections. And I love that, it's like a tight slap, it's just like, uh. How about our diffusions? And there's our big wet splashy kind of thing. A little longer decay time. You can really hear it like that echo kind of boom thing. Tell them about gain staging and that their transients hit too hard. Uh, yeah, they're gain staging at a very earthy kind of level over there. <laughs> Seriously, I got a crack in the plaster wall by the stairs. It's getting bigger and bigger every week. So reverb is super fun when you can dial it in. And it bugs me that people say the Ableton reverb sucks because I think people just don't spend the time to dial it in. The first thing I always do is go straight to quality, set it to high. Then I think about what purpose am I doing? Do I want to, what kind of space do I want to put the sound in? And then once you separate your um, reflections and diffusions and just think about size, shape, frequency, and time, it's really easy. And step one, of course, was make a good mix going into your reverb. What I did not do was I did not just jack up my hand claps all the way, jack up everything all the way and expect it to sound good because my drum mix doesn't sound good like that. Why would the reverb sound good like that? If I was doing like the kind of track where I wanted only a snare drum reverb, 
then yeah, maybe I would put the snare send all the way up, have only that one sound going in there for that huge snare drum sound, and then have the other drums somewhere else. Or if I was doing something like using acoustic hand drums from a live recording where there's natural reverb in the, in the audio, then I'm not going to put them in a reverb because they come with, you know, congas might come with like a loop that has reverb on it. So my strategy here was take really dry sounds, make a cool little drum mix using my send knobs. So I have a balanced stereo mix going into the drum reverb. Of course, the gain staging was perfect. <laughs> now the gain staging was good. So that the level coming into the um, effects unit, you can see over here the peak level to the left or the peak meter to the left of the reverb unit. It's not super high, but it's workable. What if I do what, I, what I'm gonna try to do here? I'm gonna select all the channels and raise all the send levels by the same amount proportionally. Okay, good, I got it. Now that's the hard way to mix because I had to select all these faders, make sure I had all of them, send, turn them all up. The point was to get a little more level coming into the reverb unit. Now when I kick in the effects, turn them on. The problem is that of course, the output of a reverb is always gonna be pretty low because it's just not that loud of a sound. Yeah, Matt, the Ableton reverb can be like fantastic if you spend a little time to get past the presets. So now in terms of gain staging, all right, the level coming into the reverb is nice and loud. That's a good stereo mix. The level coming out is like super baby tiny. I can hear it, I, I guess, but it's, uh, if I bypass the glue compressor, which I just did, and I'm using this tile room reverb, and it's 100% wet, I mean, that's not loud enough. Honestly, I can kind of hear it, but my channels are up all the way. I don't want to put my channels louder in the mix. I don't want, I can't turn these sends up anymore. How do I get more reverb? The basic problem is here that once I made a nice stereo mix going into the reverb, the output of the reverb was not loud enough. And I, I, I don't have a way to get more output unless I maybe add a utility gain before it, or dun, 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 here comes the savior. We're gonna add a compressor afterwards and use makeup gain to get a louder reverb coming out. And this is gonna save the day. So let's do that. Put my hands on the knobs and turn them up. So I mapped this rack so the threshold turns it on and off to make it easy to bypass. So let's just turn the threshold down enough to activate the rack and start making up some gain. Now we can hear that reverb for sure. And just for fun, if you wanna get a little more out of your reverb, you can compress it down a bit. I guess I can't, look at that. The reverb's not even loud enough, the sounds coming in are not loud enough to hit the threshold. So I can't do a compressed reverb. And then we've got our output level happening. You know what I do notice though? Here's a pop quiz. Where is a place I can get more level out of the reverb? There's one place in the gain staging process, it's after the channels, so only we're only talking about in this reverb section. Where do you see a place that something's like super low that's giving me a problem. I'm gonna kinda put the mouse over there and take a coffee sip moment, which you can't see, but that's what I'm doing. I put myself into a little box here and made a pretty bad mistake with my gain staging where what I was trying to do, you know, I was telling you like, oh, the reverb's not loud enough. Oh, we're gonna save the day with glue compressor. Oh, I jacked up the output plus 20. And then I wanted to compress it. I brought the threshold down and I'm like, hey man, Nothing's hitting. Like, why is that compressor not getting, it's not even moving the needle? Compressor threshold's down minus 40? What's going on? Well, the problem is my reflections and diffusions, I made a kind of a cool little mix, but they're like super quiet. So let's redo our gain staging with this and start and say, if I wanted more of those reflections, let's start with the reflections at zero dB, meaning the input level is the same as the output level. And then I'll just subtract the diffusions away from that. So I don't want a real wet reverb, I want it nice and kind of like fast. That's a little too dry, so I want some diffusions. Something about like that. And basically what I did was I 
continued to check my levels by putting the levels of re refre reflections and diffusions up higher from where they were before, essentially I'm making a mix, okay? Just like when you're mixing kick and snare to your master channel, right now I'm mixing reflections and diffusions into my reverb channel where reflections are like that fast, loud sound that's like almost like a slap delay and diffusions are that spacey, wispy echo sound of like, not echo, but you know, like the washy, like the shh, shh, shh. So I'm making a stereo mix of my drums into the reverb. Then I'm mixing the reverb levels as if these are two different volumes for two different sounds to get to the output. Now let's see if we can compress this thing and get a compressed reverb sound. I just made a mistake and surprised myself. I bypassed it and turned it on with a ton of compressor makeup gain. <laughs> you always gotta be thinking about gain. Bringing the threshold down. And now it's just barely starting to move the needle. I'm gonna do something and change my mappings. Let's put the peaks maximum levels at plus six. So now my reflections are jacked up to plus six. The fusions are coming in below that. Now can we use some compressor threshold? Okay, now we can see that the clap sound is hitting the compressor. We can do our makeup. And now look at our peak level meter. What I'm looking at as I turn up the compressor makeup gain is this input meter on the right side of the effects unit after the effects. And my idea was something like this. If I was using a hardware effects unit like a guitar pedal, you really gotta be careful because first of all, those things can be super noisy just by being old hardware, like a, like a reverb or something. And if you put in too loud of a signal, you get crazy distortion at the input. Some of them have a little red LED that comes on when they're distorting, but some of them don't. So gain staging with effects is really important to get the right level coming into the effects unit to have the optimum signal to noise ratio or the best quality sound. And then the output level, you wanna bring it back to the mixing board with very little buzz from the electrical hum and a lot of the effect sound. So what I'm doing in this Ableton unit is basically taking care of the input level by making a send knob mix as loud as I could. I took care of the reverb levels by balancing the reflections and diffusions. So they're both kind of loud or as loud as they can get. And then I use the compressor to raise the overall level again. And I use the threshold trying to do some compression on it and realizing that even with the gain staging I did, there's still not really allowed enough reverb to get super compressed. So what I might do is play with the dry wet to do a little bit more of that, but let's see where we're at right now. And now that I have the, um, the output level of the effects unit is a lot higher on the peak level meter, I'm gonna go up even more with the makeup gain. Get my mouse, get the blue hand. All right, now check that out. When I look at the peak level meter coming out of this effects unit, that is a nice, healthy, loud signal. Of course, it's gonna be way too loud in the mix. Matt says play with the density, I know. That's a good move. Here we are back at the dry drum mix. And what do we got for drum reverb? Now it sounds good at like minus 20 dB. I'm not sure if you noticed, but the first time I brought up the reverb, we were up at like, what, minus 12, minus 13. And now the reverb return is like a good eight dB lower, which is great because that means the sound coming through the reverb unit is a bunch louder. We're getting a better quality reverb. Why does this matter? Who cares? Does it actually apply to our lives? Am I just measuring numbers? Yeah, it does apply because when we have a louder sound coming out of the reverb, we get more detail that we can more easily mix and dial in the sound we want. So now I'm gonna bring up the return. And because we have tons of level to hear it loud and clear, I can go to the density. Matt, what do you like about density? I think it's like a kind of darker, lighter thing.
All right. And I think that sounds cool. Now we're down like minus 25. There's our drum sound. And just to continue the last example about compressed reverb, I'm gonna back off the dry wet. There's our drum mix coming into return A. And just so you know, I'm uh, moving the um, stream volume up and down to make it so we can always hear what I'm doing. So here's our dry level. Let's go to 50%. And check out our compressor. We're getting a bunch of compression on here. Which is kind of cool because compression brings up the level of that reverb. If we have dry wet 50% and no compression, it's like, I don't know, can I really hear that? Bonk. Matt says density is great for shaping and adjusting in the mix, making it come together. Try it on pads. Let's do that in a minute. Let's compress this down. And apply the mute test. Let's bring in some other elements and see if we're still doing all right. I knew something was wrong. Now I feel much better with that low end in there. Reverb. even come down a little. So just to review, we took our drums group, we made a stereo mix using send A knobs going into the drum reverb. The first thing I did was kind of for an exercise, but just for fun, I muted the whole entire return effect unit, and I just listened to what was coming out of send A and pretended, hey, what if this was, uh, what if this was the drum mix? Does that sound like a nice mix of drums? My goal being I want to make a balanced stereo mix of all the drum channels coming into return A. And that's what we're doing with sends and pan knobs. Then I kicked in the, refer the reverb return unit, did some gain staging with reflections and diffusions to talk about the two different parts of the sound. So basically I'm thinking about this effect unit like it has two, like it's a two track effect where one track is reflections, one track is diffusions. I made a blend of those two. Then I made a mistake and they were the blend was okay but the level was too quiet so I raised up the whole level, did some parallel compression basically with a dry wet blend on the reverb and glue compressor so that our effects unit sounds like a drum kit with a nice wet reverb and when we bring that into the whole mix we get a nice cracking drum drum unit that feels good so it's about 240 let me know if you have any questions or if you just want to tell me that I'm completely amazing <laughs> Here we go. Instrument group, same thing. We're going to make a stereo mix into reverb B. The uh, elements of the sound are this bass line, two pads, and this lead. And you know what? That lead might not get a ton of reverb for a different reason because we have a delay unit. So let's start with our bass line and our synth reverb. What kind of a... Uh, got going on over here we've got the same reverb unit uh, let me just make sure i'm bypass no gain boosting up let's start our levels on the reverbs at zero and zero let's bypass our reverb now we're going to solo return b and why do i hear nothing because all the send knobs are down now our goal is to make a stereo mix listening to send uh send b return b now, do I want to start with send B all the way up? I don't think so, because that bass instrument is the loudest or the most powerful sound in that group. So let me start with my bass level around two thirds, see if I can get these other people, people, <laughs> characters coming in. And 
remember when I change my pan position on the channel, that affects the stereo return, which is so cool. Aux stereo mixes are fun, or stereo return mixes. So now I've got these two uh, pads coming in here. Oh, that's why I was confused. I had the, the send up on the whole group, my mistake. All right, now we're hearing just the pads. Nice and soft background. Let's get the bass coming in. Basic question here is, can I identify every sound? Can I hear them all? And let's get that lead in. And I only want a little bit of that because I'm gonna put that into the delay and we're gonna do something special with that. Now let's go to our reverb unit. We have a balanced stereo mix of our source elements. Unit shows that the level is overall pretty low. Oh, let's do my little trick. I'm gonna select all these channels. I'm gonna raise all these levels until... Track 18 had the highest level, so now that one's up to max. The other ones are proportionally adjusted around it. Aux B is getting a louder level coming in. A little heavy on the right side, but that's okay, because that's what the source mix was doing. Now I'm gonna kick in the reverb unit. And there we go. We've got a reverb with a mix of the instruments coming in that we can use to add some space around those things. Let's stop and think, what kind of a reverb do we want for these sounds? Do I wanna have a super washy reverb where it's all overlapped on top of itself? Well, I don't think so, because there's a chord change, and if the chords are overlapping on top of each other, it sounds kind of mushy. So I don't want a super long reverb, but I do want one different from a drum reverb, because these are not percussive. They're not like crack, crack, crack. So I want something in between a super long cathedral reverb and, and a tile tight drum room. So that's my basic reverb concept. How do I get there? How am I hearing these if there's, they're all at zero? Am I on the right channel? Yeah, okay. There's our diffusions. Let's start with our diffusion levels. And I'm just stopping and starting to listen to the decay time. And what about our density? I want that a little on the low side. Now let's bring up the reflections. Let's remember, I had that at minus 3.5. Let's check the other, other side of the reflections. Oh, right away I noticed that the ping is much more obvious in the early reflections compared to the diffusions. All right, so let's go with our diffusions up to three and a half. That sounds kind of usable. Um, remember, we're listening to only the reverb. So let's pause here and check the level with the instruments in the mix. See how our reverb's doing. Are you hearing that? I hear it when I stop, but when it's playing, here's our return at zero dB. I'm having a problem because I'm not hearing the reverb, which means our gain staging is not working right. Why do I have minus three dB over here? Let's put that up to zero. No, let's remap this and go to plus six. Let's jack the gain. <laughs> I know Ableton has default at plus six. I mapped it to zero because I thought, you know, maybe that would be good, but it's not enough. So 
And Matt said, mute it. Yeah, I did. I muted it and brought it back in, and it didn't, didn't really make an obvious difference. So if the reflections were, um, oh, I guess it adjusted it. They were at like minus three and minus seven before. Let's make sure I. So what if our reflection level is at plus six? Oh, no, our diffusion level is at zero, and our reflections are going to be lower. Let's make that a little bigger. Okay. Now let's try this test again with a little bit of a louder reverb. Believe it or not, that's still not working. It's time for our glue compressor. This time I'm going to make sure the gain is down before I kick it in. There we go. All right, when I bring the threshold down, I can see the compressor is getting some level. Let's start adding makeup gain. And I don't want to compress it hard. I just want to know that's where the level is coming into the unit. So the compressor is actually getting level. Here comes our makeup on a reverb. There we go. Now that's a proper reverb. Of course, you can't really tell anything in a vacuum, so let's bring in the other elements of our mix. Now where does our synth reverb belong? So those are going to be louder than I would really have them for a final mix, partly because I'm in headphones, partly because I'm streaming and I really want you to hear it, and partly because it's fun when you're doing exercises to push it a little too hard and then back it down later. But the idea is that basically we made a balanced stereo mix going out of our sends into our synth reverb. Then we applied some gain staging techniques at the same time as tone shaping to um, dial in the flavor of the reverb making sure that we had enough level coming out of the reverb with our diffusions and reflections. Finally, enough level coming into the glue compressor that the threshold comes down. We can see the gain reduction moving. That tells us, okay, the compressor is getting signal. We know where the signal is roughly. And now we can use some makeup gain to get it coming up to a healthier level on the way out and then back it down. So let's, let's see how much level we can get out of this effects unit and then take the return B level down. <laughs> That's the maximum level we're going to get out of it. And you can see the um, peak meter at the end of the effects unit is nice and loud, and that's all reverb. That's all. That's like a gallon of espresso right there. <laughs> Too much for the mix. Let's back it down with the output of 
return B. And the overall feeling I get is the synth reverb feels like it just makes the synths a little louder in the mix. I don't really feel it as separate from the actual instruments. Like the drum reverb, I definitely feel that as a separate thing from the drums. It's obviously a reverb, but the synth thing, it's like a shimmer, you know? It's like, it's like there's just like, I don't know, like if you're looking at a car and a cloud goes by and it changes from being cloudy till the sun comes out and it's like the same car, but it feels like a different light. This kind of reverb is sort of like that. So it's a, uh, oh, that was almost an hour of talking about reverb. I love it. <laughs> I really, this is really how excited I get about these things, uh, which is why your nights go by in the studio. Let's go over to the ping lead. We got one more return. It's return C. It's a delay. I love delays. They're like my favorite thing. So let's just mute these little reverbs. Not that we don't love you. We just want you to shut up. <laughs> and what do we got the ping lead? The solo return C. Turn up the ping lead return. special. And now we're only sending one instrument in, so I'm just going to turn this all the way up, leave it up, do all my other gain staging with the effects units. Now this has um, all these controls that are mapped are for controlling the echo plugin in Live 10. So we've got delay time. The high pass filter is mapped in the filter section. You click this little triangle to see your high and low pass filters. And notice that the resonance is mapped to the same knob. So as you filter it out more, you get a little more resonance. And we can do a bandpass filter by pulling the highs down and the lows up. And the resonance gets even more in that middle space. And it's starting to self-oscillate because that resonance is sending a little higher level in there. So. Matt Schultz says, I would not use a return reverb on the synths. They're already filling the space very nice. I would use inserts here to place them in different depths. Do you mean a different depth of reverb on each synth, or do you mean put the actual instruments at different depths in the mix? I'm curious, because the kind of music you're making is all about that mid-range atmospheric ambience. So I think your mix experience on synth reverb is very interesting. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm playing with Different things that affect the output of this echo plugin. I don't think I mapped the um, power switch on the glue compressor yet, right? No, I did not. Here's how you do that. Enter mapping mode, clip on, click on the power switch of the device, click on the threshold knob, and since this is a compressor, I want my knob to be off when it, the knob is all the way up, and that's when the compressor is not operating. It's at like a zero dB threshold. So I want to map the off switch to happen when the knob is at the top of the range. So enter mapping mode. Can't figure out which one it is, so I click on it. Oh, live shows me it's right here. Pretty cool. Let's go minimum 127, maximum 126. That way, when I move this knob all the way to the top, the device is bypassed. And when I come down just a little bit, doink, it pops on. Look at that. The knob barely moves. The device pops on, ready to use. Matt said, yeah, different depths in the mix. OK, uh, I, I love your mixes, and I know they sound right. But I'm curious, could I achieve that by doing a different depth, like with track 17 and 18, right? If I put them at different volumes and different pan positions and different reverb levels, wouldn't that accomplish the same thing as having them at a different depth in the mix with inline reverb? Or do you mean using two totally different reverbs? I'm curious. So uh, what am I doing? I'm doing delay. <laughs> I'm starting to think about, like, what are the possibilities? <laughs> so OK, we've got our compressor dialed in. Now I can read the level coming out of the echo plugin and use the compressor to get a little more gain. There's our ping lead. Notice on the left side, the input meter is saying, the ping lead is not kicking out that much. And for this lecture, we have no choice. I don't want to send the ping lead level up. I don't want to send my returns, my sends to pre-fader. I'm showing you what to do. If that's the level you have to work with and you have no other choice, what you're going to do is get a hold of some device after the echo effect to get a little more gain. Let me be consistent here. Let's set the output of this effect to 0 dB. 
And now I'm going to read the, the peak level meter post effects and see how much I can get out of this effects unit by adding compressor gain, makeup gain. And look at that, 11, 12 dB of gain. I get a nice healthy level of delay, pure delay, 100% wet coming out of that effect unit. So it's a concentrated de delay, very clean. If I was using a hardware effects pedal, this is how you get a clean delay without that background buzz, you know what I mean? Let me pull my send level, my stream volume down when I unsolo just to make sure I don't blast myself or you. Okay, return C is muted. Do I want to unmute? No, because I don't know how loud that is. I'm going to take return C level all the way down to minus infinity, then unmute carefully, then bring it back up. You might think that's a little extreme caution, but if this aux return was going to somebody's headphones and you just unmute at full level, they're going to like poo in their pants and, and fire you and leave the studio. Don't want to ever hit somebody in the head like that, so <laughs> or yourself. So I bring the level down, minus infinity on mute, fade up our echo return, what do we got? And I hear on the ping lead the notes are repeating. What's that coming from? I think. Okay. To me, that looks like somebody recorded this with an arpeggiator. So the ping lead, the source sound, has some notes that are repeating from an arpeggiator, which is like a delay, but it's not. So that's one thing we can be aware of. Now we want to add to that with the real delay. Let's mute a little bit. All right, what I like is that the delay time is the same on the effects return as it is on the original source, that eighth note delay. Taka, 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 taka. So now the delay is like building up around the ping lead, adding to it, filling it in in the mix. Probably I would take the original source uh, down a little bit after this because the delay is kind of like multiplying the level of that sound. Let's bring our other return sounds back in. And the last thing you can do for fun, what if I want to add this delay into our synth reverb? Right click, send B, enable, and Now the delay, the wet sound of the echo, is going into the reverb. And to make this fun, I'm going to take the um, original ping lead totally out of that reverb. So here's our reverb on B. And we're going to hear only the delay coming into that reverb. Let's see if we can actually hear that in the mix. I mean, I'm not sure at this point, it's really like a subtle thing, but I get the feeling that, I get the feeling that the ping lead gets louder when I put the delay up into that reverb. So I'm gonna leave that up and say, this is all part of our ambient sound shaping thing. And the end result is that you can hear the sounds in the mix in a space the way you want. You might not be able to differentiate, like, can I hear the difference between the dry ping going in the reverb versus the delay ping going in the reverb? Maybe not, but you know, who cares? It sounds cool and I'm having fun with it and it's fun. <laughs> and then maybe let's take our reverb down a little bit. Check them out. Well, I can definitely hear that. I can hear the synth reverb.
and I can hear the drum reverb for sure. So there we go. That is a spacious mix with reverbs where we calculated how to make number one, a stereo mix going into the reverb. Let me go back in camera land. I haven't been in camera land for a little while. It's an hour. Oh my God. Hey everybody, it's Steve. I'm not using my green screen today. I'm just doing a little t-shirt video in the room. Um, I didn't want to move the screen around and all that. Who cares? So we've been talking about gain staging and mixing. And the main idea is that um, you want to get your sounds up to a nice, healthy level at the source. So you have the best quality sound to work with. Then you can make a stereo mix at your master channel. You can make a stereo group of all the drums in one stereo group by themselves. So you could compress and EQ that as a unit. You can make a stereo instrument group. And when it gets really interesting is with vocals, where let's say you have a lead vocal with three channels, center, right, and left. That's a stereo group, and you have to mix those. Then you have background vocals. I did a session with like eight, eight tracks of background vocals, like eight channels of background vocals that were all in use. There was vocoder, one with the, the artist gave me like a reverb one, a vocoder one, a distorted one, like all these different ones that were adding, and then overdubs of like actually different time with different words that had to become like a stereo field of background vocals all around the main mix. And I was like, stereo group. And by having those things in groups, you're basically making a whole bunch of submixes. And as long as each submix sounds really good, when you bring them all together in the main mix, your main mix is going to sound good. And it's really easy to just adjust your submixes to the amount you want. So if you're like, oh, that one background vocal is sticking out, you don't dig through 50 channels to find that one. You go to your background vocal channel, bring the whole thing down a little bit, and just see if that works. You know, there's a lot of ways to mix with groups. It makes it a lot easier. And knowing how to make a balanced stereo mix at the subgroup level helps you make a ba better balanced stereo mix at your master channel. And aux returns are no different. Making a drum mix into your drum reverb is another balanced stereo mix. And when I say balanced, I mean right, left, balanced pressure levels on your stereo field. Um, uh, Danny Noble, what's going on? Nice to play around with this for uh, subtle textures. Yeah, Matt says the drums really breathe with this reverb on it. Yeah, that's nice to hear. Thanks. Maybe um, keep a little background music for my blah, blah, blah. So the art of making a balanced stereo mix is really a simple thing about measuring and adjusting your sounds at every place they touch on the way to the end result. So eventually your end result is going to be the master channel. But don't sweat the master channel too much. Break it down in chunks. You know projects are easier when you break them down in chunks. First, put your drums in a, stereo, in, a, in a stereo group. Just mix the level of the drums, make them sound good. You could even use a reference, reference mix of some beat loops and think like, does my drum loop sound like a professional beat loop? Kind of fun. Make a balanced instrument group with your you know, bass line and leads. Uh, make a balanced mono group with your kick and your sub. And just make sure that those two sound good together. And then by the time you're done, you bring them all into your main mix and the whole mix is much easier to craft. Let me just show you a little bit about that back in Ableton land. Here's my groups, right? What if I think, oh, you know, I, I added those reverbs and now my drums are a little too loud. Well, I can go to one channel, bring the whole drum group down. Do I have to select all these 10 drums and try to get each one of those volume faders after automation? No way, that would be a total pain. So I just get that one fader and I can get my whole mix working with one knob, one send level. If you have any questions, let me know. It's uh, a little after three. I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon. So I've been talking about gain staging into stereo groups with effect returns. We used our send knobs to make a mix from send A into the reverb, synth B into the synth reverb, adding space and dimension, and then send C into the delay. Danny said, this one I'm trying to concentrate on my current progression, cohesion, and sounding polished. Yeah. And you know, a good stereo master mix, it's OK if it doesn't sound totally polished. Because remember, the mastering process is when they're going to do the final like multiband compression to get your drums really just in the right range compared to everything else. Uh, when you add that master channel compression, you know the reverbs might get a little louder. And a little EQ on the whole track as a whole can bring all those things together. So th I think that final cohesion really does come out in the, in the mastering process, but you can get a good ways there in the mix process. So that's what we talk about in my new gain staging course. And since I'm so excited about it, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it right now. Here is the Mixitecture member site. And courses.mixitecture.com, I put the link in the YouTube description. 
Right over here is a new panel that says Gain Staging and Mixing Techniques. Pew. Click on there, you come in. Uh, it's updating in progress, so the text that you see on the screen isn't the most up-to-date thing, but the cool part is these modules are getting updated. So the teaser has videos with gain staging terms and gain staging tools, where I explain what is headroom, signal to noise ratio, signal path, distortion, clipping, gain staging, what is the definition of gain staging? I go through those on video to make sure you know what we're talking about before you even take the course. And if you know everything and you totally got it down, you don't need the course. So <laughs> that's a little uh, separate the uh, men from the boys there. Uh, gain staging at the track level, that's where we go individual channels and we use compression, EQ, limiter, utility gain to just set the level of the sound coming through the input. Just like when you drop a new record with a DJ mixer, you go to the top, the trim knob, you look at the, v the VU meters on the analog mixer, and you turn up the trim knob to make sure your new record is going to come out loud when you put it after the old record. So we do individual track gain staging, then we go mixing tracks. That's where we make a stereo mix with just the channel volumes into the master channel at a simple basic level, like when you first make a new track. Then we go to groups and effects, and that's where we were today. Oops, I clicked the button to buy now. Uh, mixing groups and effects is where we'd have like, just like today, with the drums in a stereo group, instruments in a stereo group, effects on return channels, and we make a mix that way, which is actually easier than mixing individual channels. And then the next layer after that, mixing buses and effects, that would be like where you have maybe three stereo drums, three different groups of stereo drums, like you know the electronic kit, the acoustic kit, and maybe some risers and crash effects, and those are like three separate group tracks in live. You put them all into one stereo bus, which is like making a stereo mix of all your drums that are coming from group tracks, and again, effects. And then finally, there is a bonus module about guides and videos, and this used to be the whole entire course. Now it's just the supplementary stuff with Cheat sheets and stuff, like about you know eight great mix tools is in there, a 10-step mix down process is in there, a whole video about um, like mixing with levels and kind of like a workshop like this, but with uh, looking at meters and stuff. And all these things give you an overall introduction to the mix process. So we're not gonna talk about detailed vocal processing for you know like a Michael Jackson record. We're not gonna go super deep into the actual end details of every sound. We're gonna talk about gain, pan, volume, and how that affects your master mix. And believe it or not, you can make a fantastic record with very simple tools. We talk about EQ and compression a little bit, but the main heart of it is just how loud do you put your kick drum to make a solid mix where the bass drops on the end? You know, where do you put your levels so that when you turn up the volume loud, your record sounds like the records you buy that feel really, really good? And to give you a quick preview, I'm gonna go into live and open up one of the actual lessons from the course. The thing that makes these so cool is they're hands-on session lessons. They're not videos. They're actual interactive Ableton projects that you do inside live. So I'm gonna open this up and show you what you actually get when you buy the course, download a live pack, expand it, and get it on your computer. This opens up like this on the side panel, gain staging and mixing techniques. It says, welcome, this is the first lesson, blah, blah, blah. I know you don't wanna read it, you wanna play it. Here's what you get when you press play. <laughs> I just got the little bump. I was not in live. Hey, thanks for joining me. I'm Steve Knotts, and welcome to my gain staging course for Ableton Heads. We are going to learn how to set the levels of all the audio in a mix to end up with a track that sounds loud, clear, crisp, wide, and drop some bass on the bottom. <laughs> just like I just said. So we go through these audio instructions, and the, the revolutionary thing about session lessons is that the tutorial is built inside live. There's stuff about, you know, what to do if you have questions, a little link to the terms and tools video. Now we go into some actual activities. Go to the next scene and press play to hear the track. It's gonna be a loop, so listen a little bit and press stop when you're done. And that's before mixing, so I know it's crazy loud. And then we analyze it. What did we just hear? Well, obviously it's electronic music. Okay, let me show you a little bit of the activities later on. You know, there's some intro stuff that you might want not wanna do. Specific instructions. This sound is gonna be a different kind of challenge. Select track six, do shift tab so you can see the waveform and play through the loop. Whoa. I want you to hear the sound and see where it happens in the clip because there's a bunch of silence in between. All right, so I'm telling you exactly what to do, where to look, what's happening, and how to work with these sounds. So you actually learn something about gain staging, and at the end, you learn how to do all these activities, gain staging on all these different tracks. I give you some specific answers of what settings to use so that your mix makes sense. And then we have a before and after. So here's our end of the lesson. Ew, that sounds like a high-frequency, <laughs> mid-range kind of squeaky track with no low end. Why? 
well, the bass is missing, the sub bass is not loud enough, the whole thing is out of balance, and it just doesn't even work. Notice that the channel faders jump back up to zero, so technically you could think, oh, the track got louder, but it does not sound good. All right, let's look at these two examples to understand what we're talking about. This is before gain staging with um, the channel effects not dialed in, and after gain staging, even with all the mix faders at equal level minus nine, we've gone through every individual channel, set the EQ, some compression on all these different tracks, and just listen to the difference of those two. Here's after, and we're gonna go to before. It's gonna get ugly. I'll wait for the loop. One, two, three. Now, how are you gonna make a mix if your starting sounds are that crappy and unbalanced? All the faders are up at zero, it doesn't sound good. So what we do is you learn how to go through this whole session, take all these audio files, do the basic gain staging with the individual channels and groups to end up with something that you can turn into a mix. And this after phase, it's not even mixed yet, and it sounds better. I mean, look at this, every channel is at the same equivalent level. We didn't even start mixing the actual output volumes, and it already sounds a lot better because we did effective gain staging to get these sounds in shape with good signal to noise ratio using all available headroom and not distorting or having clipping on the master channel or anything like that. Hugo, thanks for hanging out. We're at the end anyway, it's about 3.15. So there's a link in the YouTube description of where you can get the course. I'm uploading new hands-on session lessons this week. You can go through an interactive process of learning, gable, learning gain staging in Ableton Live. I don't know of anybody else who's built an actual interactive course where you can learn this by doing it. I mean, a lot of people talk about it like, oh, you gotta do gain staging or they show you on video. It's not the same. When you listen to it and actually tweak the knobs and go through the process and understand why we're doing everything, what to do, and you do it yourself, that's how you learn to do it in your own projects so you can apply these techniques to every project you ever touch for the rest of your life, and you should. I've been saying gain staging is like, you know when you're driving, you, um, before you change lanes, you look over your shoulder to make sure you don't crash into somebody? Gain staging is just as automatic as that. You, like, you make a part of your workflow where you just do it as you're working on sound design or as you're recording a new mic or as you're building a subgroup or something. It becomes part of your workflow to just read your meters, make sure you see the level of the sounds and they're at an optimal level, and by the time you get to the mixing it process, it's so much easier. Uh, in the restaurant business, we had a thing called clean as you go, which means you don't just cook and make a mess all over the place and clean up at the end of the night because you'll be there for three hours and you end up losing your knife under a pile of onion skin and you, you throw the knife in the sink and somebody cuts their hand. No, you clean as you go to keep your workspace clean so you can add new projects. If, so, if a new order comes in, you have a clean space to work on it without getting overloaded. And it be becomes like an eternal thing where you can always use that kitchen forever. If you don't clean as you go, you end up in a pile of garbage and the kitchen becomes unusable. Gain staging is like that. If you do it every, as a background program that's always running, you end up with fantastic mixes and you never get stuck with a crappy sounding mix that you can't fix. You never get stuck trying to turn up channel faders and not having enough sound. Uh, like we saw with the reverb, you don't get stuck with a reverb that you can't hear even when the channel's all the way up. We had to solve that problem with gain staging in our effects unit. So I could talk about this stuff all day long because I really enjoy it, but I got to get off here. It's been about an hour and 15 minutes, and I know people have other things to do. So this is going to pop up on replay. If you have any questions, drop a comment. Let me know how you like it. And this course is coming to life this week. I think it's going to be the best intro to mixing course in the Ableton universe, and I'm really excited about showing it to everybody. So let me know how you're doing, and thanks for watching. See you all on Friday for DJ Set on Twitch, playing tracks from Matt Schultz <laughs> and other people. All right, thanks, everybody.